So we're, we're going through our discipleship track series, and uh, one of the things that we're doing in this grow section is that we are learning a scripture together every week. And uh, so last week we talked about Jesus, and I want to know who can remember Hebrews 13, 8, who can remember our verse about Jesus? For shame. Okay, I'm going to say that you guys, uh, oh, that's why, okay. I'm not going to ask you to come up here and say it. That's, okay, now I, now I know why some of you guys uh, weren't raising your hands because then your family members were forcing your hands up. I'm not going to ask anybody to come up here. I think that I've put people on the defensive with that one. But Hebrews 13 and 8, what does it say? Jesus Christ is what? That's right. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He has always been who he is right now, and he will always be who he is right now. And we talked about that last week as we're kind of exploring in this section the nature of the Trinity. So exploring the nature of God the Father and what his nature reveals to us about who God is. In the last week, we talked about Jesus. We talked about the Son and what the Son reveals to us through his nature about who God is. And today we're going to introduce the final member of the Trinity. Again, we've talked about the Father and the Son. And so today we're going to look at the nature and the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is often the most misunderstood and overlooked member of the Trinity. Despite this, a proper understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and the role that He plays in our lives as followers of Jesus is critical to our healthy walk with God. After all, the Holy Spirit is God here with us now. And you're going to hear me say that more than once today. The Holy Spirit is God's presence that is here with us now, guiding and teaching and empowering and comforting us. Today, we'll examine the work of the Holy Spirit more deeply and discover how essential He is to our spiritual growth and our relationship with God. Here's the truth. You cannot have any relationship with God, much less a healthy relationship with God, if you do not have an understanding and a, an inner working of the Holy Spirit going on in your life. And I believe that one of the strategies of the enemy is to make the Holy Spirit seem either unimportant to us or unbelievable to us as a deity. The Holy Spirit, again, is the God that we have here with us now. And so we need to know who He is and what He does and how He, work, he, how he wants to work both in our lives and through our lives to empower us to make an impact on the kingdom of God. So if you go back to creation, you've got the Father who's coming down in the cool of the day. We talked about this a few weeks ago. And he's having this really intimate, close communion with Adam and Eve. And it's this beautiful picture of what God intended and what God still intends for his relationship with man to be like. And so there's God here on earth with man in the garden. It's a beautiful thing. And then what does man do? Messes it up, right? You ever felt like God just put the ball on a tee for you and you still struck out has anybody ever felt like that before i mean he puts man in the garden it's beautiful it's amazing he says hey you have dominion and control over all of this stuff i mean there had to have been thousands of trees with fruit in the garden and he said all you have to do is stay away from this one tree. And so what does man do? <laughs> they go to the one thing that would mess it up. It's just like God to put us in a, as good of a position as he possibly could put us in and still give us free will, and it's just like man to mess that up. 
So that's what happened. God was here on earth with man. Man messed it up, right? So then the son comes. Jesus, we talked about this last week. He comes, and Jesus is the God that we have here. Emmanuel, the God that we have with us here on earth. And what does man do? Puts him on a cross. Like, it's the plan of God, but also, I think we could safely say, a mistake to kill God. So what does man do? Messes it up. So now, God, in his infinite mercy, in his infinite, never-ending grace, is giving us one more chance. We had a chance with the Father, we blew it. Jesus came, and now we have a chance with the Holy Spirit. But if we miss out, on our chance with this God who we have with us here now, if we miss out on this final opportunity with the Holy Spirit, there's only three, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We talk about, and we really don't have time to get into this today because it's just not what the focus of today is, but there's a verse in Scripture that's, that's really, really misunderstood, and it talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit and how if, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that there is no more forgiveness after that. It's the unforgivable sin. And people really take that and twist it into a lot of things that it's not. But to blaspheme there, if you go back and actually study it, to blaspheme there really just means to reject. We've taken it to mean mock or, or downplay. Or if you like, I know when I was growing up in charismatic circles and spirit-filled churches it I, when i was a little boy and there were people around me who were speaking in tongues and i was like hey that's pretty cool and so i'm gonna do that and so i started acting like i was speaking in tongues and so i go up to this kid that's a little bit older and i'm jabbering you know some nonsense because this is what the people are doing around me and the kid's like oh no you just blaspheme the holy spirit and now you can't go to heaven can you imagine anything worse for a four-year-old kid than thinking, there is no hope for me? I just totally blew it. Thankfully, that's not what the Scripture is talking about. What it is talking about is a rejection of the Holy Spirit. And what God is saying is, you rejected Father, you rejected Son. This is the last chance, and if you reject Holy Spirit, then there is no more forgiveness to be found. There is no more forgiveness to be had. The Holy Spirit is here with us now. We cannot have relationship with God without the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we're going to talk about four things. We're going to try to move through them as quickly as we can this morning, but this is important for us spiritually today. Talk about four things, the nature of the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in and through us. And the first thing that we have to understand about the Holy Spirit is this. The Holy Spirit is the breath of God that gives life. This speaks to the deity of the Holy Spirit. He is the breath of God that gives life. He is, the Holy Spirit is God. This is the third week now that I'll say this, but it's very important. The Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Father is. The Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Son is. And so a lot of times we think about it, in our culture, like Father, then there's the Son, and then way over here, if he even gets acknowledged, kind of the weird God in the room, there's the Holy Spirit. That's not what it is at all. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all equally God, all working together. And so this speaks to the deity, the Godship of the Holy Spirit. He is the breath of God that gives Life In Genesis, the Bible reveals that that is what the Holy Spirit did at creation. We look at Genesis chapter number 2, starting in verse number 5. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground, and the Lord God formed man 
of the dust of the ground and breathe into his nostrils here it is the breath of life and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life and then man became a living being in this passage we see the origin of human life god formed adam from the dust of the earth but it wasn't until the breath of god entered adam until god's own breath entered adam that he became a living breathing soul the breath of life in this verse here refers to the holy spirit the life-giving spirit of god who brings god's creation again to life this is more than just a metaphor it reveals it reveals that without the spirit of god there really is no life at all there's a deeper study that can be done here and i would encourage you to take the time to go and do it but the ancient word for breath is spirit so when we read breath in the ancient how they would have understood that is spirit so when we read breath of god they would have read that and understood that as spirit of god the hebrews knew that it actually was the spirit of god that was breathed into man at creation and brought him life and we're still living with that same breath in our lungs today god's breath gives physical life we see that all the way back in genesis but what about spiritual life jesus talks about this in john chapter number three he's having a conversation with nicodemus probably one uh some of the most uh memorized and recited uh verses at least verse maybe in all of scripture comes from john three sixteen. in this conversation that jesus is having with nicodemus but if you go back a little bit earlier in the conversation and start in verse number five it says jesus answered most assuredly i say to you unless one is born of water and the spirit unless one is born of water and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of god that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit do not marvel that i said to you you must be born again the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes so is everyone who is born of the spirit go back a few verses let's read it again that which is born of the flesh is flesh but that which is born of of the spirit that's where our rebirth happens that's where our regeneration happens that which is born of the spirit is spirit so in this passage jesus reveals that just as we are physically born we also must must be spiritually born again the holy spirit is the one who brings about this new spiritual birth regenerating us and giving us new spiritual life the breath of god that breathed life into adam in genesis is the same breath that brings spiritual life to us when we are born again just as we're made physically alive by the spirit of god and the breath of god we are also made spiritually alive by the holy spirit when we accept jesus christ as our lord and i got this really cool picture in my mind of this happening and i want to try to convey it to you this morning just for a minute i want you to stop and i want you to try to picture this in your mind the father has just created man the father has just created adam all the way back in genesis the beginning of time as we know it god has just created adam from the dirt of the earth did you know that that's what you are dirt look at your neighbor say hey look do it say hey if you have a spouse definitely look at them some of you wives have been waiting for permission to say this for a long time it's been a bad week here it goes you ready look at your neighbor and say hey you're a dirt bag
You're welcome. Not in my notes, by the way. The Father, oh goodness, has just created man from the dirt of the ground. Man is fully equipped with everything that he needs for life. All, all the organs, you got a brain, arms, legs, fingers, no belly button, but everything else that we have, Adam has. But he's still laying there lifeless. And if you were there, you would look at Adam and think, he looks like me. He looks like uh, a man. You may just think that he was asleep. You may think that he was dead. But then God breathes his spirit. The spirit of God enters Adam, and you see this body come to life and get up and walk around. What was just before this, a lifeless body could now live and function as he was created to live and function. And in your mind, you, if you actually can get a picture of that, it is an amazing thing. Now I want you to think about you being that lifeless dead body because spiritually that's exact, that is the exact position that you were in. You had everything that you needed to function in the way that God created you to function, but you were still lifeless and dead without the Spirit of God. And then when you decided to call on the name of Jesus, when you decided to begin following Him with your life, what happened? The Spirit of God came into you, and spiritually, you woke up like Adam woke up when the breath of God went into his body. Spiritually, you got up and you could walk around, and you could function in the way that God designed and intended for you to function, but only after His Spirit came into you. His Spirit gives us life. Physically, yes, but also spiritually. All power for life comes through the breath of God. Number two this morning is this. The Holy Spirit is the anointing of God that gives power. So He's the breath of God that gives life, but he's also the anointing of God that gives power. In addition, he, uh, he empowers us to fulfill all of God's purposes in our life. Throughout Scripture, we see that when God breathes his Spirit into people, they receive the power to do what they cannot do on their own strength. If you look before, so we're going to talk about this in the coming weeks, but the Holy Spirit came to earth. We said he's the God here with us now. That happened on the day of Pentecost. Before that, in all the Old Testament stories that we read, you'll read, and the Spirit came upon Samson, and the Spirit came upon David. And so God would deploy the Holy Spirit to come and to anoint and to empower for a season, for a specific season, for a specific person, for a specific purpose. But it's not like that anymore. Now, and again, we're going to study this out more here in just uh, a few minutes and then especially in the coming weeks. But now that same power is available to all of us. It's not limited to a specific person or even to just a specific event or purpose. The Holy Spirit's power is available to all of us. When we see in the Old Testament, though, when we talk about the breath of God and the Spirit coming upon someone, that's what we're talking about. It is the anointing that came on that person, the anointing of God that came on that person to do what God intended them to do. We see the power of what can really happen when we accept the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives in Ezekiel 37, verses 9 and 10. And he also said to me, prophesy to the breath. That's, that's the Spirit. Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath, that's the Spirit of God, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. 
In this vision here, Ezekiel sees a valley of dry bones. It symbolizes a lot, but it symbolizes Israel's spiritual death, their spiritual hopelessness. But when the breath of God, the Holy Spirit, came upon these dead bones, they come to life and become an exceedingly great, an exceedingly mighty army. This demonstrates that the Holy Spirit not only gives us life, but empowers us to transform or empowers and transforms God's people into something powerful. Where there was once death and defeat, the Spirit, when the breath of God comes in, brings life and victory. And again, that's why the enemy wants to discourage us from growing in the Spirit, because the Spirit is where our power is i want you to hear this this morning the spirit of god the holy spirit is where the anointing is the holy spirit is where all the power is for us today as followers of jesus and it's easier for the enemy to fight a dead army it's easier for the enemy to fight a dead church and when you take the holy spirit out that's what you have there's no life there. Why? Because life comes from the breath of God, and that is the Holy Spirit. If we, if we want to live in the power and purpose that God has called us to live in, we only have one way to do that, and that's to be connected with the power of the Holy Spirit. Move into the New Testament in Acts chapter number 1, starting in verse number 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait on the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put and his own authority but you will receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and you will be witnesses to me in jerusalem and all judea and samaria and to the ends of the earth so here jesus is getting ready to give the vision of the church capital c bride of christ he's getting ready to give the vision of the church but before he says go he says whoa I want you to go to all the nations. Start here where you are and expand with the good news of the gospel. I want you to take the good news everywhere. But before you do that, I need you to wait. Because you're going to need some power if you're going to have any success carrying out this vision that I'm giving you. So I want you to wait on what Jesus calls the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father. The power of to be witnesses does not come from the strength of the disciples and it will not come from our strength either but from the holy spirit this promise was fulfilled again on the day of pentecost when the holy spirit came upon the disciples and they began to preach the word of god boldly the message of jesus boldly leading many to faith in jesus christ the same spirit who empowered them continues to empower believers today equipping us to do what god has called us to do so here at wellspring church again jesus gave the vision of the church however we phrase it however we say it jesus has given the vision of the church therefore go and make disciples of all nations any vision of the church that is not go and make disciples of all nations is a vision that man has come up with because jesus very clearly gave the vision for what he wanted the church to look like go and make disciples now the way that we say that here is that we are growing equipping and sending disciples of jesus christ into all the world that is our vision and we will never realize that vision as a reality unless we're empowered by the holy spirit to do each one of those things growing equipping and sending disciples it's going to take a power that is greater than what we can produce go and make disciples of all the nations are you kidding me I couldn't get from hot springs to my house without running out of gas in my truck yesterday. 
and on my own power, I'm going to go into the world and make disciples? Don't look at me so holy. You're not going to do it either. It's like you've never ran out of gas before. <laughs> Just sitting there on the side of the road an hour away from home. That's a whole nother story that we don't have time for. Go and make disciples of all nations. Here's the thing. With love, you can't do it. Go and make disciples of all nations. What a joke. You can't do it on your own. You're going to have, if, if the disciples who walked the footsteps of Jesus had to wait on the power, then certainly today we need the power of the Holy Spirit if we're going to carry out the vision of going everywhere and making disciples of all nations. We've got to make sure that we are connected to Him. It's the... The presence of God, the Spirit of God in our life, that's what brings the anointing. As long as we're talking about anointing, let's make sure that we all know what anointing is because we all need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The anointing isn't just for the pastor, it's not just for the staff, it's not just for the board, it's not just for your grandma, it's not just for the elders. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is for every single believer. And if you don't believe that, then you don't really have a true understanding of what the anointing is. So let's talk about it in one sentence really quickly. Here's what the anointing is. The anointing makes you better than you are on your own. The anointing of the Holy Spirit makes you better than you can be on your own. And I got to tell you, I need that. I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit because I need to be a better father than I can be on my own. I need to be a better husband. Watch it. Then I can be on my own. I need to be a better pastor than I can be on my own. I need to be a better friend. I certainly need to be a better witness for the kingdom of God than I can be on my own. And you also need the anointing of God permeating every single part of your life, influencing every single part of your life. Why? Because the anointing just makes you... Who wouldn't want that? The anointing just makes you better than you can be on your own and it's the anointing of God number four last one the Holy Spirit is active in our daily lives the Holy Spirit is active in our daily lives the Holy Spirit isn't just something that we read about in the Bible he's not just some kind of theological idea or Uncertainty. He is actively at work in the lives of believers today. The Holy Spirit was not just for the first century church. He predated the church. He's still uh, working. And until this church age is over, he's going to continue to do the work that he's doing. And then at the end of time, he's still going to be there because he's God. He was there before time. He will exist after time he's just like the father and the son in that he didn't have a beginning and he will not have an end but now today he's here the god that we have here with us on earth now and we need him to be involved in every aspect of our walk with god from guiding and teaching to comforting and convicting us when necessary john 16 5 through 11 says but now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you who ask me, where are you going? Because, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. 
It is to your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. And he said, it is to your advantage. It's better for you if I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, it's the Holy Spirit, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you will see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So here, the Holy Spirit is called our helper, and he's also called our comforter, and promises that he will convict the world. He, he came for a purpose. It was to convict us of sin and righteousness, and eventually there will be judgment. This means that the Holy Spirit is at work in the hearts, in the lives of unbelievers, drawing them to Christ by making them aware of their need for salvation. But he's also at work in the lives of the believers. He's comforting us, which is good. How many of you ever need comfort? He's helping us. That's good. How many of you ever need help? That's what the Holy Spirit is here to do with and for us. He's guiding us as believers in all righteousness and helping us live according to God's will for our lives. This is also, again, just kind of a tangent theological point that you should go and think about and study out. This is also why salvation after the rapture is going to be incredibly difficult if not nearly impossible i've talked to people who have said well if it's going to go the way that you say it's going to go i'm just going to live my life now however i want to live my life and then after the rapture goes i'll know i got a little i got a little window there and i'll get everything right then if you can't follow jesus today in the world that we live in you're not going to follow him when they're cutting your head off But even more than that, even more than your own willpower to try to do that, the reason that it's going to be nearly impossible for people to come to faith in Jesus Christ after the rapture is because of this. It's the Holy Spirit who convicts. It's the Holy Spirit who draws. It's the Holy Spirit who's pulling on the heart and the spirit of the unbeliever saying there's something that's missing there's something more for you you need relationship with God do you know what, the, what else the Holy Spirit is called he's called our guarantee for the rapture he's called the deposit that we can take knowing that if the Holy Spirit is here, God's not going to leave him here forever. And one day, when the rapture of the church happens, do you know where the Holy Spirit's going to go? Gone. So if it's the Holy Spirit that draws people by conviction, and the Holy Spirit leaves at the rapture, who's going to be here to draw? Not the Father. We're partying with him. Not the son, he's already came. And the Bible said that he came once and for all. He's not coming back again to do what he's already done. It's only the, the Holy Spirit is the last chance for humanity. So when he leaves at the rapture, it's going to be hard for people to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because there is nothing there pulling them to that knowledge. There's nothing there that's pulling on them to come to Jesus who will be here to convict the answer is no one who will be here to empower the answer is no one who will be here to comfort Acts 9 31 then the churches throughout all Judea Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. And again, here we can see that the Spirit gives us comfort and the Spirit brings peace to the early church, even in the midst of persecution that 
they were going through. He strengthens believers and enables them to walk in the fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, but he doesn't just convict us, us of sin. He also comforts us in our pain. He encourages us in our trials. He empowers us to continue on in our faith. So as believers in our own lives, that's what we can expect when we get connected to the power of the Holy Spirit, that he will guide us, that he will comfort us, that he will convict us when we need to be convicted, and that he will lead us closer to Christ as he helps us live out our faith. The last thing is this. I actually jumped it a few minutes ago, but I want to come back because I know that there are some people who are taking notes, and I said that there will be four things, and if I leave you with only three things, you won't be able to sleep tonight. He leads us to closer he leads us closer to Christ. That's the fourth thing this morning. The Holy Spirit is always pointing people to Jesus. That is to say that if it's not pointing people to Jesus, then it's not the Holy Spirit. I've seen some wild stuff done in the church in the name of the Holy Spirit. And without judging it, you can look at it and say, that's not pointing anybody to Jesus. The Holy Spirit will always be pointing people to Jesus. And there are scriptures there. You should go read John 16, 12 through 15, Acts 1, 4 through 8. Acts 1, 4 through 8 actually says, the purpose of this power was not to glorify the disciples or even the Holy Spirit himself, but to make Jesus known in the world. That is one of the primary purposes of the Holy Spirit is to point people to Jesus. So if it's the Holy Spirit that's working in and through our lives, what are we going to be doing? Pointing people to Jesus. It wasn't about the anointing coming on the disciples so that the disciples could be known. It wasn't even about the anointing coming on the disciples so that the anointer, so that the Holy Spirit could be known. That's what the scripture says. It was about the anointing coming on the disciples so that Jesus could be known. So if we take that same logic and apply it to our lives, it's not the anointing coming on me so I can stand on a platform, so I can hold a microphone, so that I can be known. God, forgive the modern day church for being filled with people who want to be known. Do like this. Because it's not about us being famous. What the scripture says is it's not even about the Holy Spirit making himself famous. Because that's not his role in the Godhead. The anointing comes so we can make Jesus famous. Everything that we do is pointing people to Jesus if it's anointed by the Holy Spirit. He's a vital part, an active part of the Trinity. And having a relationship with Him is it's just mission critical to our spiritual lives. Our verse for this week Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's what we're going to memorize for next time. But you will receive power when the that's the anointing. 
the power to be better than you are on your own. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And what will you do with that power? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you will take that power and you'll be the greatest preacher the world has ever known. That's not what it says. You'll take that power and you'll apply it to business and you'll be a great entrepreneur and you'll make hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. That's not what it says. Is there anything wrong with good preaching? No. Is there anything wrong with making money? Certainly not. But it's not what the anointing of the Holy Spirit is there for. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will take that power and be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria. And what that's doing is it's moving out. They were in Jerusalem. You're going to take the power to where I put you. Jerusalem. Then you're going to go to Judea, like the state, the area around. You're going to go to Judea. Then you're going to go to Samaria, by which they all would have gasped because they detested those people. They wouldn't even say their names. He said, you're going to go to Samaria. You're going to go to the places that nobody else wants to go with the good news of the gospel you're going to take the good news of the gospel to the darkest places to the places and to the people that society has forgotten about or wants to to the most neglected to the most abused to the most forgotten that's where you're going to go on your own no with the power of the Holy Spirit And he says, when you're done there in Samaria, then just go everywhere. To the ends of the earth, if you can find a person there, they're worth telling. That's a good verse, Acts 1.8. We're going to memorize it for the next time that we're together. You guys stand with me this morning.